So last week, um, as you may recall, we, we covered Archman and cleanliness and home. So a simple Archman procedure, of course, if you look on our YouTube channel, you'll see there's a simple Archman procedure and there's an elaborate Archman procedure. Do whatever you're comfortable with. The simple one is enough. And actually, you can see the video of Shilla Prabhupada, uh, actually several videos of Shilla Prabhupada when he was doing deity worship. He was just a simple Archman. Uh, and Shilla Prabhupada did have a lot of experience at, at deity worship. It wasn't that he wasn't uh, inexperienced. When he was living in the, I think it was the, uh, the Banksy Gopal Temple, the first place he lived in Vrindavan, he was actually a Pajari there. You know, so he did quite a fair bit of deity worship there. So he did have experience, but he still did the simple uh, deity worship. But, you know, if you want to do more elaborate, that's, that's fine. But just keep in mind uh, to do the deity worship at a level that's comfortable for you to maintain. Then also we covered cleanliness. Cleanliness is a very, very essential component uh, of deity worship. And, you know, it's actually the main thing. You know, if you want to learn something uh, on, on deity worship, the real thing to learn is, is how to be clean. If you can get that one point out of deity worship, then you, you've, really, um, you've really got the main point, I feel. Um, okay. Um, then, then today we're going to cover basically bulk offering. The first point we're going to look at is why to offer food to the Lord. And, uh, and also what we want to look at what causes the Lord to accept their offerings because, you know, uh, that's a very, very important element. Now, I, I spent a few hours this morning shooting a video. Um, and uh, Facebook is stuck. Oh, we're having a great day for technology today. Um, let me just, sorry about this. Uh, stop my stream. I don't know. It says it should be working, so I, I don't know what to say about that. Oops. Um, identify, uh, yeah, imp we're going to identify some important considerations when offering bulga and what, explain why they're important. Um, then looking at the essential steps in, in bulg offering, yeah? Okay, so without uh, further ado, we'll get right into it. So bulg offering at home. Right, so the, the first step. So the first thing I wanted to look at was um, why offer bulg food to Krishna? Because we often hear devotees talk about offering food to Krishna when we are beginning devotional service. And we hear it's a very, very important element of uh, our, our spiritual evolution. Uh, evolution. And now I'll be sending you out a, a, a document, you know, again, with, with quotes, references from Srila Prabhupada, especially there's some really nice quotes from the third chapter, which explain uh, why it's an important activity in devotional service. But here we're going to look at why we do it, how we do it, and why does he accept uh, we're going to explore offering food to the Lord, and and, um, and and hopefully in a few days, as I mentioned, I'll have the video edited and uploaded. It's all very new for me. I've never you know been on this side of the camera before. I'm usually on the other side of the camera. But um, yeah, so we're going to look at now just briefly discuss why we offer food to Krishna, because you know in the scriptures we hear that Krishna is self-satisfied that he doesn't need anything, yet still we're encouraged to offer food to him. It's kind of, it seems a little bit contradictory. He's self-satisfied, but why should we offer him anything? He's already got everything. So I want to look at this a little bit more closely and see if we can understand the reasons behind this. So the, there are a number of uh, um, points here that are quite essential. One is that it gives, you know, by, by engaging in service to Krishna, it gives us the opportunity to develop a loving relationship with him. And another point that's really important is anyone, no matter what situation they find themselves in, can offer something to the Lord. You know, you can look at situations, for instance, like um, there's that nice story of the, uh, the Brahmin and the cobbler. And the cobbler, he was very poor. He had nothing. He lived under a tree. Yet still, he was able to offer uh, um, Narad Muni a glass of water and a place to sit. You know, so, and, and that's the thing that Krishna, he makes that point in the Gita. He says, whatever you offer me, I'll accept it. Yeah? Now, as we see, it explains in the Bhagavad Gita 13, uh, 3.13 that by offering food to Krishna, it helps us to become free from material entanglement and thus become free from sin. And there's a, there's a very important verse there also, uh, Yagna 3.9, I think it is, Yagna Tat Kamanon Yagna, Loko Yang Karma Bandana. 
So by, by doing things, you know, by offering uh, sacrifice or, or whatever we have to, for, to Krishna for his pleasure, we become freed from bondage in this material world. And then there's a nice section there also in, in, in the Gita where it talks about how it helps us to develop finer brain tissue and thus leads to clear thinking. Um, also, it helps us to develop the awareness that Krishna is a sentient being, you know, because we're offering service to him. And as we're offering these services, we start to develop deeper and deeper realizations. Uh, it shows how Krishna is absolute. There's that nice verse uh, for those of you who are associated with this gone temples. There's that nice verse that uh, we chant every morning, the Darshan, Angani, Yasha, Sakalendri, Abritti, Manti. It explains how all Krishna's senses are, are interchangeable. For us, when we eat, we need to take the food and put it into our mouth. But Krishna, he, he can just hear the mantra. And through that, he can, he can eat. When he sees the food, just by seeing the food, he can eat. So uh, as it explains in this verse, it's all, all these senses are interchangeable. And also, it's a great act of mercy and compassion from the Lord upon us. It enables us to engage directly in service to him and thus derive immense benefit. Yeah? And also, a very practical element of it, we have to eat to survive. So, you know, in our current situation, if we just go and eat things without offering them for, for, for sacrifice, as explains in, in the Gita, we become bound up in this material world. So Krishna gives us the opportunity to offer sanctified food by offering it to him. And thus our, our existence becomes purified and it satisfies our material needs. Devotional service really is the only panacea for living entities in, 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 this, in, in this material world because through devotional service, we can overcome our, our complete and utter lack of qualification and achieve the, the highest realms of devotional service. And deity worship offers us such a wonderful opportunity to do that. So in the, um, in the quotation or in the, in the list of quotes I'll send out you to, today, there's also some points for reading at the end. I encourage you to, to try to read these, these verses from Bhagavad Gita, chapter three, verses nine to 16, then chapter nine, verses 22 to 28. They cover quite a lot of uh, interesting information uh, there about the benefits of offering food to Krishna. Now, the next thing that comes up is, is kind of like a, a really important point. And, um, you know, I, I've heard this rationalized in, in, in many, many different ways. And it's actually the conclusion is actually quite simple. Because, like, you know, sometimes, I mean, you, you may have done this yourself, you know, reflected, well, does Krishna accept our offerings or, or how do I know that Krishna has accepted my, my offerings? Or, or maybe, you know, you might reflect sometimes, well, you know, I don't know if he's accepting this person's offerings because they're not so strict in devotional service or something like that. So the point is, how do we know that Krishna's accepted? Right? So devotees might uh, give different reasons uh, why they think Krishna would accept. One would be he'll only accept if there's Tulsi. But what do you do if you don't have Tulsi? Does it mean you can't offer food to Krishna? No, I don't know. Uh, some, some devotees say if it's done according to Shastra, then Krishna will accept. Done according to proper etiquette, then Krishna will accept. Um, uh, well, uh, well, yeah, etiquette will accept. Or offered to Srila Prabhupada. If we offer to Srila Prabhupada, because Prabhupada has love, therefore Krishna will accept. Done according to the rules of devotional service. Uh, some devotees say, well, Krishna and Srila Prabhupada are very merciful. Lord Chaitanya and Lord Jagannath are very merciful. So they'll just accept naturally. And then, of course, some will say, well, if we have a desire for bhakti, then Krishna will accept. And of course, as we know in that, uh, that well-known verse in the, uh, the ninth chapter of the Gita, where, where uh, Krishna says that patram pusham param toyam yome bhakti parayachati. He says, one is offered, if you offer with love and devotion, then Krishna will accept. And the very interesting point in this verse that pointed out by Srila Prabhupada and the other charis is that Krishna says bhakti twice in this verse. So it's really emphasizing the need for bhakti. So this is the essential point in making a bhog offering is that there must be bhakti. But then that, that then straight away one can pose the question is, do we have bhakti? Because, you know, I, I ask this question, I, I do this exercise most years in my when I present this class, 
and and I asked the question of all the devotees, because we come to the conclusion, the natural conclusion, that Krishna only accepts that which is offered with devotion. But then as soon as you ask the devotees, do you have devotion? Then not many devotees are willing to put up their hands. So yeah, it's uh it's a it's an interesting point, but um, I just want to set about proving that we all have devotion. Now, there's an interesting section in the beginning of the nectar of devotion, which is uh, you know from pages you know, Roman numerals 21 to 25, and this is actually the the first part of this, the first half of this introduction is actually the first chapter of Rupa Goswami's Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu. Now, he gives a definition of, of, of Vaidhi Sandha Bhakti there. And he says, a very ni- nice verse. I, I think many of you may know this verse. Anya Abhilashira Shunyan, Jnana Kamani Anavritam, Anukuliyana Krishnanu, Shilanam Bhaktir Uttama. Now, this verse is, is quite interesting. And, and this verse is actually, um, according to our acharyas, this is the quintessential verse of the Bhakti Rasa Mrita Sindhu or the Nectar Devotion. And the whole nectar devotion is based on this verse. This is what they call in Sanskrit terminology, a paribhasa sutra or the essential verse of the scripture. So it has two sections. Now I won't go into it in great detail because you know, some, some of the acharyas, particularly Jiva Goswami, has gone into this verse in great detail, but it has two sections. And it has what they call a um, uh, sarup lakshana, which is a primary characteristics, and then it has a tatasta lakshana, which means the secondary characteristics. Now, oftentimes you'll hear that, that, you know, I'll just read you the translation so you can get the gist of it. When first class devotional service develops, one must be devoid of all material desires and knowledge attained by monastic philosophy and fruit of activities. So often we hear, this is, this is the first half of the verse that's being quoted, that, you know, devotional service must be freed from, um, you know, uh, any uh, idea for jnana or karma. You know, it's just completely, this shunyam, zero, must be zero. Uh, or abilas, abilas means desire. So you must have no desire for anything other than Krishna. But this is actually the highest standard of devotional service. And if this was the requirement, then many of us would probably miss the grade. Uh, because, you know, so I, I, at least I can speak for myself, it, it is I am not at this highest standard of devotional service. But this is actually the secondary characteristic of this verse. The primary characteristic is the second line, where it says, Anukulena Krishna Anushirana Bhakti Uttama. So this this is the primary characteristics, and and and, and, and the points that, that are done here. There's three primary characteristics here, which uh, the acharyas point out. First off, is the devotional service is done for Krishna. This is this Anushirana Krishna Anushirana means it's done for Krishna. It's only for Krishna. Devotional service, and the second uh, the second primary characteristic is. Devotional service is an active engagement. We're, we're actually, we're actually, you know, doing something active for the pleasure of Krishna. Then the 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 third point, which is brought out by our acharyas, is devotional service is executed with a favorable in, intent. And this is this anukulena. We do it with a favorable intent. We do it because we want to please Krishna. And this is the primary characteristic of devotional service: is we're doing things because we simply want to please Krishna. And if we have that motivation, if we have that intention, then Krishna will accept our offerings because it's devotional service. So we can see that, that simply, simply explained by in, in this verse is that just by doing things with a favorable intent for Krishna, then, then uh, he, he, he accepts what we have to offer and, and it's actually classified as being devotional service. And, you know, even we look at, you know, the different stages of the practice of bhakti. You have Vaidhi Sadhana Bhakti, Raghunuga Sadhana Bhakti, uh, Bhava Bhakti, and Prema Bhakti. So what we're doing now, Vaidhi, Vaidhi means rules and regulations, Sadhana in a regulated fashion or regular fashion, Bhakti. So we're practicing the rules and regulations under the guidance of the spiritual authorities, the spiritual master, and this is Bhakti. Why? Because we're doing it for the pleasure of Krishna. We're doing it uh, for, for him, and we're, we're actively engaged, as, as Prabhupada would often say. It's not for armchair philosophers. It's not you, you sit around and talk about it. No, devotional service is active. So you, you can see that even though we may not be you know, manifesting ecstatic symptoms, even though we may not be on the highest realms of devotional service, even though we may not be freed 
from material desires uh, like jnana, karma, etc. Still, because we're doing it for Krishna's pleasure, because we're, we're, we're trying to act in a favorable way to please Krishna, then Krishna accepts. And this is the point he makes in, 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 uh, in um, Bhagavad Gita, that he's doing it favorably. Facebook's not stuck. I just haven't moved the slide forward yet, yeah? which I'm just about to do for the devotee who keeps popping the message up. Okay, so the next slide, which you should get in a second. So attitude, this is a really, really important thing. Uh, and you'll, you'll notice it in the slide when it comes up, it says attitude is everything. So yeah, very, very uh, important point. Um, let's see, um, we can look at uh, different attitudes. I mean, obviously this could, practically be a, 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 a seminar all, all on its own, at least a one webinar all on its own, because uh, there's so much involved in, in the correct attitude. And so we just wanted to sort of touch on this briefly. What is the appropriate attitude for offering Boga? Do we think Krishna will accept because I have brought to it for him? You know, if I brought something, Krishna's naturally going to accept because I'm following the ritual, I'm doing whatever I'm supposed to do, Krishna will accept. No, it's not like that. You know, I'm such a great devotee. I'm such a great cook, you know, even I told the story last week, which I got, I got the, the, uh, one of the, the characters wrong. It wasn't Uddhava, it was Vidura. Um, but Vidura was offering him, you know, he wanted, Krishna came to Vidura's home. Vidura was so excited to see Krishna that he wanted to offer him something to eat. And so all he had was some bananas. His wife brought him some bananas and he was peeling the banana, throwing the banana away and giving Krishna the skin and Krishna was eating it because of his bhakti. So being a wonderful cook is not necessarily the right thing or not necessarily the qualification or the attitude that's going to uh, inspire Krishna. But if we have the appropriate attitude and service, as, as this slide here says, attitude is everything. So humility is so important. Respect is so important. Yeah? Um, and, and there's a really nice lecture that Srila Prabhupada gave uh, in Los Angeles in 1969 when he installed the small Radha Krishna deities there. If you have access to this lecture, I really encourage you to listen to it. It's a very, very beautiful lecture. And at one point, Prabhupada gets quite emotional uh, and he's expressing some deep emotion there when he's talking about the proper attitude or the proper consciousness to have when we're serving Krishna. I'll just read a little bit from this because it's a very nice, it's a very nice uh, reference. This is, what can you offer to Krishna? Everything belongs to Krishna. What have you got? What is your value? And what is the value of your things? It is nothing. So there's a very important point Prabhupada is saying. If you look at everything we have, we could be the richest person in the world. If you compare it to what Krishna has, it's nothing. All the things in this material world. Krishna, he says in the Gita, Aham Savasya Prabhu, Mata Savam Prabhatate, that I am the source of all spiritual material worlds. Everything comes from him. So even if you were the richest person in the world, you had so much money and so much possession, compared to what Krishna's got, it's not even a drop in the ocean. So its, it's, it's, it's value is insignificant. And then Srila Prabhupada goes on to say, therefore, real thing is bhaktya. Real thing is your feeling. Krishna, kindly take it. I have no qualification. I am most rotten, fallen, but I have brought, you, I, I, but I have brought this thing for you. Please take it. This will be accepted. Don't be puffed up. Always be careful. You are dealing with Krishna. That is my request. So you can see that Srila Prabhupada is expressing very clearly uh, what is the proper attitude in, in, in our uh, performance of, of devotional service. So if we have that right attitude that even, you know, just like there was a really nice story where Srila Prabhupada, he was sitting down one day uh, and, and a, a man had, had brought some, some um, some money for him, big check. And he, he, he was making a big, big sort of um, talking about how he had done this and how wonderful he was. He was giving this to Prabhupada and sort of basically boasting and, and stuff like that. And Shura Prabhupada just took the check and put it down and didn't take any notice. And then Saraswati came in, uh, Malati's young daughter came in and offered Shura Prabhupada a flower. And, and because of her devotion, Shura Prabhupada said, oh, you have brought this for me. You are so kind. So Prabhupada was fanning her devotion. He was encouraging her in her devotion. Uh, whereas the other person was not, he was very proud. So Prabhupada ignored that. And so 
Well, it is very, very important that we cultivate the proper humility, the proper respect, because we are dealing, as Prabhupada says here in this reference, we are dealing with Krishna. Be careful. We have to understand that we're dealing directly with God. And even though we're lacking the qualification, he's very kindly agreed to uh, present himself before us so that we can serve him directly. So yeah, it's important to be mindful of that. So, and, you know, if we kind of take it from the perspective, you know, if you look at the purpose of the deity or the, the, the advent of the deity in this material world or however you want to phrase it, that, um, you know, Krishna has come here in the deity form simply for our benefit, simply to give us the opportunity to engage in loving service to him. Prabhupada sometimes would call the Archa Vigraha the mercy manifestation of Krishna because it's only for our benefit. You know, it, it, as, as it says in Brahma Samhita, he's served by hundreds of thousands of Lakshmi's or Gopis. He has so many you know, amazingly qualified personalities who, who can do so many wonderful things for him and offer it with so much love. Yet out of his compassion and his love for us, he comes here as the deity uh, to give us this opportunity so that we can engage in service to him, overcome our material conditioning, become purified, go back to the spiritual realm in, you know developing a loving relationship with him so if we reflect upon that and then engage in service to krishna this is very very helpful for us to uh develop the proper uh, mood so you know um you know we and, and you know reflecting on this it, it really sort of impels us to be prepared to do whatever is necessary to um to satisfy the lord so humility respect very very important point now another uh few points i want to bring up here uh important points in uh bog offering now there, there are so many details we can go over but there are a few things that are very very important and i just wanted to touch on these a little bit and of course you probably guessed that cleanliness is top of my list Everything must be done very, very cleanly. You'll see when the quotations, when I send them out to you, there's a section on cleanliness. And um, Shoda Prabhupada, there's a, there's a letter he wrote to a devotee called Aniruddha where he talks about the standards, of, the kitchen standards. And, and the main thing he's emphasized is cleanliness, you know, about not mixing prasad and bulga, about washing everything beforehand, etc. There's a really nice letter that <clears throat> Shoda Prabhupada sent to a devotee called Rukmini. Some of you may know her. She's the wife of Manutva, um, Prabhu, the, the ISKCON communications. Anyhow, so Prabhupada wrote her letter one, one time, and in the letter, the concluding line was, he said, the idea is summit cleanliness, that will satisfy Krishna. So he's saying that the way to please Krishna, the way to satisfy Krishna, is just by being spotlessly clean. Everything done very, very cleanly. And there's a, a, there's a wonderful example given in the Chaitanya Charita, of Raghava Pandit. Now, uh, th this this um, example is is um, Raghava Pandit is offering coconuts to uh, his deity. Now, Raghava Pandit himself he had a coconut orchard, but he heard that there was some coconuts from a distant place which were much better than his. So he didn't worry about his coconuts. He didn't offer them to the deity. He bought these coconuts from a far distant place. He washed them, he had them sitting in water because when you sit them in water, they, they become cool. And then he would clip the tops off and he'd take them into offer to the deity. Then what happened was as, as the, the servant was bringing the, the, the coconuts in, he inadvertently touched the door frame. And then so Raghava Pandit was concerned that, oh, you, you touched the door frame and, and dust can fall from the roof and it's probably fallen on the coconuts. So he rejected them and he got new ones. And Shura Prabhupada in the purport had, he, he quotes from his spiritual master, Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur, uh, and, and how he explains that Raghava Pandit was not some crazy fellow with a cleansing phobia, but actually he was interested in the highest standards of devotional service. So we can see from these examples of, of various devotees how important cleanliness is in deity worship. Everything has to be spotlessly clean. Even the, even the gopis in, in, in Vrindavan, in Gokul, they make garlands for Krishna. And when they have the garlands on trays, but they cover them with this super fine cloth so no dust can get on them. But the, the, the dust in, in Vrindavan is all drudgerized. It, it's, it's worshipable, but they don't want any dust on the garlands. They don't want it to become contaminated in any way. 
So we can see the example is there of these very, very exalted devotees of, of their concern for cleanliness. So it helps us to understand it's very, very important for us. Now, the other point we, that I have here is that, um, that uh, the quality of the ingredients is, is also very, very important. Um, now, Srila Prabhupada would, would often emphasize uh, that everything should be first class. He, he would always make this point, everything first class. And, and you know, all, all, the, all the ingredients should have first class, the utensils you have should be first class, the situation you do it, you offer it in is first class. But of course, that's going to mean different things for different people. If you're very, very wealthy, then first class uh, utensils could mean they're made of silver or gold. But if you're a poor person, it could mean just whatever you, whatever you can organize, and it's simple, but it's clean. So the idea is to do the best you can. There's an interesting verse someone showed me the other day. I don't remember the detail of it, but um, it was saying essentially along the lines that, that if, you, if you don't offer something that you have the capacity to offer, this is a sign of laziness. And it was actually condemning this kind of mentality. So the idea is, is that whatever you have, you offer to Krishna. And Krishna makes this point in again in the ninth chapter of the Gita. He says, Yat Karoshi, Yarish Nasi, Yashtu Hoshi Dasya, Yatapashashi Kuntea, Tad Krusha Madarpanam. Whatever you do, whatever you eat, whatever you offer or give away, whatever austerities you perform, do that as some Kunti, Kunti as an offering for me for me. So this is the point that uh Shura Prabhupada was really emphasizing, and Krishna is emphasizing there, is just to do everything for the pleasure of Krishna. And another point which is very, very important here is to, um, is as far as possible, avoid things prepared by non-devotees. And the main reason here is because they completely lack cleanliness. They have no idea of cleanliness. Um, and, and, you know, I mean, I, I could quote many examples of things which I won't get in because they're a little bit unpleasant. But when I was younger, I, I, I worked in various food processing factories and the things that some people did turned me off eating those products. I've never, eat, I've never eaten them again, you know, uh, which is really disgusting, the things that some people used to do. But uh, this is not really the forum for those kind of discussions. So, you know, better to avoid things prepared by non-devotees because they're just not at all clean. Okay, so we'll uh, move on to the next section. Now, there are many different ways of offering boga and you know, if you go to the temple, you see they might have a very elaborate way of offering bolga. Whereas if you um, do it at home, you might do it in a much more simplified way. So, you know, there are five basic steps in any bolga offering, which you, you can apply this in, in, in any situation. It's the same thing. So the first thing is, is preliminary activities. Um, I, I'm going to explain all these in a minute, so don't, don't worry about what they are. But preliminary activities, then purifying the bolga, Offering, uh, inviting the Lord to take the meal, offering the bolga, and um, then after the meal. Okay, so the first thing means uh, preliminary activities. Now, I'll just uh, go on to our next slide here. Now, this can include things like um, setting up the place where the bolga is being offered. It, it obviously includes bringing the offering. Uh, you can also offer flowers to the deity at this point to attract their attention, to let them know you're about to do some service. You can offer, uh, also you, you would offer a seat to the spiritual master. Now you may notice that in these next five slides that some of the text is bold, some of the text is not bold. The text that's bold are the things that you really need to be doing. So obviously you have to prepare the place where, you, where you're going to um, do the offering and that includes cleaning it. So you know if you're going to, at your altar or whatever it is at home, you would wipe the place clean. You know, with a, with a damp cloth if it's if it's a hard surface, if it's a, a, a fabric or something like that, then probably just with a dry cloth, just clean it. Yeah. Then naturally, you would also have to bring the offering in to uh, your, your altar. Offering flowers is optional. Now, the next point, offering a seat and asana to the spiritual master. This is a very very important point. Now, there's a, a very uh, extensive purport in the Madhya Lila chapter 24, text 334, where Shri Prabhupada talks about. Uh, the 64 items of worship that Sanatana Goswami presents in his Hari Bhakti Vilas. And then item five out of the 64, Prabhupada says, there must be an asan, a sitting place before the altar. 
This asan is the spiritual master. The disciple brings everything before the spiritual master and the spiritual master offers everything to the Supreme Personality of Godhead. So Prabhupada's saying, yes, there is a seat there, but Prabhupada's perspective of it was this seat is for the guru. Whereas other people would say, oh, it's for Krishna or whatever. But Prabhupada's perspective is it's for the guru. So we, we also take that perspective. Then interestingly enough, Chinani Prabhu asked Prabhupada one time in Mayapur, if this reference here in the, in the Chaitanya Chanrita, is this asan for the bulk offering? And Prabhupada confirmed that. He said, yes, this asan is for the bulk offering. Okay. So that's uh, that. So offering a seat to the guru. Now the next point, purifying the bulga. Now there's different ways you can purify the bulga. One way is you just take the archman spoon and you just sprinkle it on, on the bulga. Um, another way you can do it is that you can uh, put water on your hand and then sprinkle the water onto the bulga. There's di different ways it can be done. Yeah? Um, by the way, it, you need to purify the bulga to remove any subtle impurities. Yeah? And then you'll find that some people, they will also uh, purify the, the, uh, the bulga with mantra. Generally, they will use the, the bija mantra or, or the, the, sorry, the mula mantra of the deity they're worshipping, uh, whatever, whatever deity it is. It could be Gora, it could be Nita, uh, uh, Krishna, whatever, just the mula mantra. And you, you, know, you count on your fingers like with Gaitri and you chant the mula mantra over the bulga. This also purifies, and it also, um, it, by invoking the, the mula mantra into the food, it brings the, the, the unoffered food to the same transcendental level as Krishna. Uh, but, you know, a little bit technical, but that's okay. And then also tulsi on the bulga. Now, tulsi on the bulga, it, it, it's, you, you can do it, you, you know, if, if you have access to tulsi, you can put tulsi on the bulga when you prepared the offering. But technically speaking, this is the right place to do it. Now, the reason that it is done here, especially when devotees are doing the morning puja, they'll do it at this point. The reason it's done here is because Tulsi doesn't need to be purified. But you'll find that in, in large temples where they're offering you know, three plates or, 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 or more, you know, in, in Brindavan they offer six plates, in Mayapur there's so many plates, they, uh, they put the, the, the Tulsi on the bulga in the kitchen because there's more devotees there to do it and it's much more efficient. Whereas if you're doing it on the altar, it can, can take quite a while, especially if you, if you have a lot of preparations. So you can put it on here or you can put Tulsi on in the kitchen. But as I mentioned before, if you don't have Tulsi, then oh, actually no, I mentioned it when I was doing the bulga offering video. If you don't have Tulsi, then you can think of Tulsi uh, when you're doing the offering. You can pray for her mercy. Uh, some devotees... They'll, they'll gather uh, dried tulsi leaves and they'll keep them in a bag and they, they tend to crumble up and they'll just sprinkle a little bit of tulsi dust on the bulga. Or the other thing is some devotees, they'll have a stick from tulsi and they'll just touch the bulga with a stick. So either way, and you can put a tulsi leaf on it, every preparation or you can just put one tulsi leaf on the plate, whatever, whatever works for your situation. It's, you know, there's no like hard and fast rule there. Okay, so next slide. Um, so the next, the next category we've got here is inviting the Lord to take his meal. Now, again, we have um, several um, points here. The first one is, is offering flowers. Again, this is optional. You don't necessarily need to offer flowers. But the idea behind offering the flowers is just to draw the Lord's attention. Now I'm about to do some service. Yeah? Then, of course, you would offer the Lord a seat. This is a very important point because this is actually inviting the Lord to, to take his meal. So it's good if he sits down. Yeah? Then um, uh, you can, you know, in a more elaborate standard, you would offer water to wash the feet, water to rinse the mouth. Not necessarily in a home uh, environment, but it just depends on um, your situation. Uh, but it is part of Gordia culture that generally you wash your feet and rinse your mouth before and after eating. So just an interesting point there. Uh, point of cleanliness. Yeah. Okay. So the next one we have here, uh, this is this one is, is kind of a pretty basic one. Offering the bulga, and of course, when you're offering the bulga, you offer the bulga. Yeah? You just and usually we chant uh, art mantras to offer the bulga. Now, uh, I'll also be sending out a list of the mantras we chant. Generally, we chant the Guru's pranam mantra. Uh, if he has one or two, you'll chant those mantras three times together. Then Shiva Prabhupada's mantras. And then Prabhupada has two mantras, so you chant both those mantras three times through together. So you chant Prabhupada's first pranam mantra, 
then Prabhupada's second pranayama mantra. Then go back to the first one, then the second one, then the first one, then the second one, like that. So you chant three times through like that. Then um, if you don't have a, a, a current Diksha guru uh, or, or you're not aspiring from anyone to take Diksha, then it's sufficient just to chant Shri Prabhupada's pranayama mantra. Then you would chant Lord Chaitanya's pranayama mantra, Namo Mahabhadanyaya, Krishna Prema Pradayate. Krishna, Krishna, Chaitanya, Namne, Gaudatushe, Namaha. You chant that Pranam Mantra three times through. Then three times, Namo Brahmanda Devaya, Go Brahmanda Chaya, Chajakitaya, Krishnaya, Govindaya, Namo Namaha. Three times through. Then, depending on your environment, you would you could leave the area to let the deities uh, eat in, in privacy for some time. Then uh, you, you come back. Um, now, if like some devotees just really struggle with mantras. They just can't get it together with mantras or, or, or you know, to them it's, a, you know, all this Sanskrit and stuff is just a foreign language. That's fine. Just chant Hare Krishna for a few minutes. Yeah. It, it, it's, it, it doesn't really matter. The whole idea is just to engage in the service the best way you can. It doesn't really matter if you don't know the, the, the ritual so well, if, if you're not really, capable of the of, of, of the the complicated techniques um the main thing is to somehow or other connect with krishna somehow or other just serve krishna to the best of your capacity and just you know you know with all the the, the devotion you have at your disposal just try to please krishna he'll accept it's a simple thing and it's like that that uh, prayer or that that statement from Srila Prabhupada before you know we just pray pray to the lord you know what I have brought you is so insignificant. Please, out of your kindness, you please accept what I have brought. And this is the mood. Uh, there's a prayer sometimes to Bodhis Chan after offering Bhoga. Uh, it says, Yadatram Bhakti Matena Patram Pushpam Param Dhyam. They say, My dear Lord, you know, that you know, I, I'm so unqualified, but out of your kindness, you please accept these the, the flower, the fruit, the water, the offerings that I brought you. You please accept these things. So this is the, this is the mood we need to develop when we're. Um, uh, offering food or anything to Krishna, it's just that I'm I'm insignificant. You are you are you are the you know the, the mighty supreme person of God, and I am just your insignificant servant. Please accept my service. Okay, so that's all there is with offering the bog. We just chant the bog offering mantras. Then the last one is after the meal. Now I, I couldn't really find a, a good picture of this, so I just used a plate you know from cake and crumbs and I, I, I typed in vegetarian empty plate so hopefully it's a vegetarian meal they had there I wouldn't want to be putting up something non-veg so then after the meal um, you know the, the, the uh, you know you, you, as I said again the, the, the things involved are the things you, you need to do you must do and the things in, in, uh, that aren't bold are, are optional so you know, for, you know it's just like with ourselves after we after we eat, we 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 wash our wash our hands, we rinse our mouth. Uh, you know, we, it's good if we can rinse our feet or, or wash our feet also. Uh, but then you will will offer a seat to also to the Lord. So the way you, you can offer a seat, at least in the video that I did today or, or the thing I shot today, hopefully hopefully it works out. But um, all I did is I just rang a bell and, and just indicated to the Lord that he could go back to his sitting place. Yeah, that's all. That's as simple as that. Yeah. And then, you know, sometimes devotees might like to offer spices to chew, uh, mukhavasa, which is usually, uh, there's a nice recipe for it in, in the Chaitanya Chamrita. There's uh, fennel seeds and, and cardamom and, and different things like that, and some tulsi, and the Lord can chew it, and it gives um, uh, a nice taste in his mouth you know, after the meal. Yeah? And, uh, and, and then also you can offer mahaprasad to the Lord's associates, also an important point, uh, but not necessary here. Uh, in a simple point. Now, this offering the seat is, is kind of like um, it's quite quite a, an important point in some ways because it's just like you imagine like if you're in the situation where you were uh, eating a meal and then someone comes out and just pulls the mat out from underneath you without you know telling you okay uh, the, the meal's finished now you can go you know uh, I'm going to take the plates and stuff away. It's just a matter of a little bit of you know I guess culture a little bit of etiquette there that where um, where you know just being you know um, personal with Krishna. All right. Now I know we're running a little bit late, but uh, we we had a bit um, uh, of a late uh, start due to my uh, you know lack of technical know-how. 
Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, let's see. Uh, someone's asking. Now, let's see. Three three simple definitions here. Prasad. Prasad is what is is offered, but not what's directly on the Lord's plate. Just like you may cook something in the kitchen, or to, today I did the video and I offered some grapes and bananas. So I still had a bunch of grapes and a, a, a bunch of bananas left behind. Uh, so they're considered to be prasad because they, they were offered, but they're not on the plate. The next thing is, what is Mahaprasadam? Mahaprasadam is directly what's on the Lord's plate. So everything that's on the plate, like you'll see this picture here when it comes up in a second, you'll see that um, all those items on the plate, this is the Mahaprasadam, not what's left in the kitchen. Yeah? Then there's another term that we often uh, hear used in ISKCON, um, and some of you may have heard this called Maha, Mahaprasad. So this is... Um, the remnants of greatly advanced devotees. And there's a nice picture will come up here in a second of Srila Prabhupada, um, where he's eating prasad. And the thing you'll, 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 you'll notice is, is, I don't know how well you can see in the picture, but the plate is so shiny clean. Yeah? Everything was like that during Prabhupada's time. Everything was shiny clean because he would point it out if it wasn't. Yeah? But to get the remnants of a greatly advanced devotee is considered to be very, very uh, auspicious and beneficial. Yeah? Okay, so despite the technical difficulties, we managed to make it to the end. <laughs> so I, I appreciate your patience and, uh, and sorry for the, uh, the technical mishaps at the start. And I will certainly endeavor to be a, a, a bit more... Uh, um, how should we say, a, a, a bit more kind of prepared next time and, and yeah, get the microphone turned on at least. <laughs> so if anyone's got any uh, questions they, they'd like to uh, ask at this point, I'll do my best to answer them. Okay, so we've already got a pile of questions. All right. Uh, oh, all the first ones we can't hear. Still no sound, no sound, no sound. Okay. So fortunately, we got that sorted out. Okay. I heard that in some temples, they make a daily sweet, like a tray of cake or milk sweets, but it's offered in every offering for the day. How does this compare with the prasad versus the maha prasad? Um, it's kind of an interesting concept, this, because there is a, um, there is a, um, uh, a discussion where Srila Prabhupada was explaining uh, to devotees that... Um, with fruit, you know, say for instance, you get, you know, like watermelons, sometimes they're gigantic, you know, sometimes even this big, you know. And the idea is, is that um, if you cut out one piece of the, of the watermelon, you offer it, the whole thing's offered. And the reason is because the taste, the rasa, it's, it's, it's the same with the whole watermelon. So, um, yeah, if, if you're doing something like that, like doing a daily sweep, um, it's interesting. I, I know it's quite common, um, and and I know, for instance, like you know, if you if you you're offering you know a piece of butter or something from a block of butter, then it's not considered the whole block, or you know, because sometimes you get these 10 kg blocks of butter. It's not that the uh, the whole thing is considered often. So I think a part of it is the consciousness with which you're doing these things. If you if you you're actually considering um, uh, that it's offered, then it's then it's all offered. But if in one's consciousness, when you're considering, okay, I'm only offering these sweets, then then it's understood that you know just these sweets are offered. But when it comes to fruit, the whole piece is offered you know, because of the rust. That's the best I can answer, them, unfortunately. Now. Um, um, can we offer, uh, to, this is from Dayananda Prabhu, can we offer uh, tofu, soya, mushroom? Uh, Srila Prabhupada said that, that uh, soy products were, were very high in protein, so we don't offer them. Uh, mushrooms, he said, are in the mode of ignorance. They grow in the dark, so he said we don't offer them. Um, can we put Tulsi Manjaris on bulgur? Should we put Tulsi on Bolga when offering Prabhupada? Yes, you do put Tulsi Manjaris on the Bolga because that's uh, part of the offering process and Krishna will accept it when there's Tulsi there. 
You can when you're offering to Prabhupada uh, because then the, the meditation would be that he's going to offer that to Krishna. So to save him from putting the, uh, the Tulsi on there, you can put Tulsi on there. And if you're going to use Manjari, then use the small soft ones, not, not the, 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 the dry hard ones because I don't know if you ever had the experience you chew the dry hard ones, sometimes they can stick up in your teeth and it's quite painful. Um, and I remember, um, you know, because we're offering to Krishna and, and uh, last night, Banu Maharaj was giving a, a, a seminar on, uh, from the Nectar of Devotion, from the second, the second part of the Nectar of Devotion. And he was talking about some of the, some of the Udipanas that, you know, or the, the impetuses that attract Krishna, that, that attract the devotee to Krishna. And one of these, uh, impetuses is, is Krishna's softness. Krishna's so soft. It's just it's so incredibly soft that if you touch his skin with a flower petal, it will bruise him. Uh, he's so incredibly soft. So you can imagine that his, um, his mouth is also very, very soft. So yeah, be mindful that when we put Tulsi on the, um, on the uh, boga, that it's soft Tulsi mandaris, not, not hard ones, yeah? Okay, so some of our uh, Facebook devotees. Um, let's see. Okay. Um, let's see. We already have a picture of our guru. On, this is from... Vijay Baladev Prabhu. We already have a picture of our guru on the altar. He sits on an asan there. Is it still necessary to offer him an asan separately? Yes, you, you do. You physically offer him an asan because the, according to Sri Vaishnava um, understandings on uh, this, there, there's six different asans. So the, um, the, there's the, the bog asan, there's the paryanka asan. Bog asan obviously is where, where they're eating. Paryanka asan means like the couch, you know, when, when, when he's relaxing, giving darshan to the audience. Just like when you see the deities uh, giving darshan, this is the Paryanka Ashan. Then also there's the Snan Asan, where the Lord bays. There's the Shayan Asan, where the Lord is, is sleeping. Then there's the, um, uh, what do they call it? Yatra Asan, which is um, where, where, you know, festivals, when he's on a swing or when he's on a palanquin or something like that. And the last one is, what's the name for it? Uh, the, the, the dressing, Alankar Asan, you know, where the Lord's getting dressed and ornamented with jewelry. So by offering him an Asan, you're moving him, say, say for instance, the Guru's on your altar at home, then that's, that's considered to be the Paryanka Asan. So you're moving him from one situation, you're asking him, not moving him, you're asking him to move from one situation to another situation. Yeah? So yes, you, you would offer him the asam if that is suitable for you. Um, then uh, if we use Tulsi stick, does have to be used after each use? This is not a, 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 a practice that I'm, I'm, I'm overly familiar with because I've been fortunate enough to always have Tulsi. Um, I wouldn't think you need to rinse her unless there was prasad stuck on, on, on the stick. I, I probably would rinse her then because there'd be prasad on the stick. Um, but um, yeah, because Tulsi is pure, she's always pure. If our altar setup is rather small, do we still have to have seats for the Lord or can we just offer it in the mind? Yes, you can offer in the mind. You could also uh, simply just offer a flower petal or you could just by a gesture of the hand, just, you know, just like this kind of offer him a seat. It doesn't have to be a physical asan if it's not practical. Um, uh, here's another interesting question. Uh, Prabhu. Uh, it stated that the fermenting bacteria in Italy and dosha about it is the same as the sourdough bread bacteria. Would you say sourdough could be possibly offered to Lord then? Um, generally speaking, none of the fermented things get offered to the deities uh, unless, they're, unless they're fermented and cooked on the same day. Uh, this, I learned this from Padmanabha Goswami at the Radha Raman temple. That's the practice they have there. Things that are fermented overnight, they will not offer to the deities there because they're considered to be impure. Uh, Radha Sharan Prabhu, should grapes be peeled? You can do it if you like, but it's very time consuming. Um, I, I did the bog offering today and I didn't peel the grapes because, you know, consider you have 100, 200 grapes, it's going to take you all day to peel them. Yeah. Uh, let's see over here. Um, 
if someone is in their period of contamination touching tulsi leaves uh, and can they be used for offering um, I, I think in the home environment you need to be very practical with that uh, that that you know if you know because like previously you look in in like traditional indian households it wasn't just like you know like uh, these days they have what they call a nuclear family which basically means husband wife children previously it was husband wife children uh brother brother and wife children or sister and wife children you know there was a whole extended family the parents were there and, and so like you know if, if one one of the ladies was was uh in in her period of contamination then someone else could take up the worship but in, in the environment we have now, um, it seems that like, you know, it, well, it, it seems it's practical that, that, that if, you know, if the, the lady's in a period of contamination, then who's going to do the worship? Husband's working, you know, or if the husband's working, children aren't old enough, then someone has to do the worship. And Prabhupada, he makes this point in a letter where he says that, of course, it's better not to do it, but uh, the worship has to go on. You can't stop the worship. So this is a very, very important point. And another question here, can frozen vegetables, fruits be offered to the deities? Srila Prabhupada was not in favor of offering frozen um, um, things to the deities. He said they were all rotten, nasty things. So it, it better if you can avoid them, yeah? But then, um, um, you know, like, like in, in situations like, you know, countries where you cannot you know like, like in some of these really really cold places you just cannot get fresh food everything's frozen and it's shipped in from from very distant places you need to be practical but if you're in an environment where you can get fresh food fruit and vegetables then better do that so again you you need to uh, uh, adjust things in time place and, and, and available conveniences and inconveniences which is a really nice verse and purport in the first fourth chapter sorry fourth canto of the bhagavatam where Srila Prabhupada makes that point. You know, according to time, place, and available conveniences and inconveniences, we worship the deity. All right, I'll just tell you, do a few more questions. Um, uh, one more thing. At the temple, we purchased large quantities of boga, for example, a whole box of fruit. It would be very impractical if the whole box would then become prasad after I something from the box. No, the point I was making, Prabhu, was, was one piece of fruit. Because even if you have, you have two apples, right? They look the same, color, everything like that. You, you eat one apple, it tastes... A little bit different from that apple the taste is different between one piece of fruit and another yeah but if it's one fruit you have a big big watermelon it might be you know three foot long a meter long and if you take one piece out of that single piece of fruit then the whole piece of fruit is considered often not that like if you have you know a truckload of, of watermelons you offer one piece and, and, and then automatically all often if you meditate like that they can be but um not that they, they are definitely often all right, um, Radha Shalini, uh, Martha from Sydney. Uh, cleanliness is a relative thing. It is different for different people. How do you deal this, with, with this in a temple deity department? The best thing I find is if we personally set a good example of cleanliness and just, uh, you know, whenever we see devotees doing something, uh, you know, it's just like, you know, the old saying, catch them doing something good, catch them doing something right. So if you see devotees are doing... Uh, the service nicely and, and, and cleanly, then encourage that and, and set, set a good example of yourself. That's, that, that's about the best you can do. Yeah. Um, no, it's dried uh, Prima Priya, David Darcy, thank you. Uh, sometimes we offer dried fruit, we don't offer the whole packet. No, it's the same thing. It's like if you offer one piece of dried fruit, you, you know, if you eat one piece of dried fruit and you eat another piece, you will notice there's a slight difference in the taste. It's, it's the one single piece of fruit, the rust is the same, you know, it, 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 it's, it's going to, um, um, you know, change from piece to piece. Oh, here's an interesting topic from uh, David Key, David Darcy. When Noah Hinks of products are available for offerings at home, what should we do? Is it best to use vegan products such as nut-based milk instead of dairy products as, uh, as, uh, as a substitute? Um, Krishna likes milk. This is the important point. Krishna likes milk. He's not a vegan. He's not gluten-free. He likes milk. If you don't have the opportunity to offer um, gluten-free products or, or, or you know, um, a hinks of milk, or especially the hinks of milk, 
then just offer whatever milk's available. There's even evidence that should have Prabhupada in the early days, he would himself drink milk that had this, was enriched with vitamin E, I think it was. And vitamin E in those days came from fish oil. And that was the only milk you could buy. You couldn't buy anything else without fish oil. So the point was that, you know, Krishna likes milk. So, of course, <coughs> excuse me, in the home environment, you know, that's, that's specifically for the temple environment. In the home environment, because, you know, I, I know, I know of devotees who are themselves vegan. And, and you, know, you know, if you look at, there's a really interesting point that was made by Srila Prabhupada's, um, uh, his sannyas guru, Bhakti Pragar Keshav Maharaj, who wrote the introduction to the first published deity worship book in his form. And he makes the point that worship in the home is based around the needs of the family. So that then indicates that if, you're, if your family is vegan, then naturally you're going to be offer, offering vegan things to the deities or, or gluten-free things to the deities at home because otherwise, what are you going to do with things? You know, you, you have to set up a, a free food store or something at the front of your house to, um, to distribute all these things you're offering to the deities. No, you just, you know, the, 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 it's based around the needs of the deity, uh, based around the needs of the family. But in, in the temple, it's different. It's based around the needs of the deity. So there's, there's a different situation there we, we need to apply uh, according to situation and the last question i'll take because we've run a few minutes over can we use um saffron during a of course saffron is a petal from uh, the crocus flower i'm not a petal sorry it's the, the stamens from the crocus flower it's, it's part of a flower it's not f-l-o-w-e-r not f-l-o-u-r you know, so there's no grains or beans in it it's um um as part of a flower. All right. Um, so I, I really do appreciate uh, all your, um, your your participation, your comments and questions as well. And looking forward to seeing you all next week or you know, being here with you next week. And I'll endeavor my best to make sure that uh, all the technical issues are resolved. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much, Sir Prabhupada Ki Jai.